Hey there, from Yemen to Cuba to Australia, I mostly find Joe Biden's foreign policy to be really disappointing. But I think that makes it all the more important that I celebrate it when Joe Biden gets something right. Like a three-year-old, U.S. presidents need to be rewarded for their good behavior if you ever want them to improve. And the only word I can think of to describe what Biden has pulled off in Afghanistan is victory, and a stunning one at that. Uh, to say the least, this is not the standard story we have been getting. So uh, with today's video, I would like to point out how Joe Biden has pulled off a great victory for the US public, for the world at large, and yes, even for the people of Afghanistan. The first thing to emphasize is how crucial Joe Biden himself was to this withdrawal. I tend to downplay the power of presidents. Five of the past five of them have campaigned on getting less involved in the world and focusing on the problems at home. But all five have ended up expanding U.S. intervention abroad. Donald Trump's presidency was a caricature of this, of course, filled with tweets that he had no idea how to transfer into policy. But Barack Obama, the constitutional scholar with the Muslim father who campaigned on peace? Well, he was probably even worse for the Middle East than Trump was. The fact is that when faced with the incredible mass of pro-war media and financial power in the United States, presidents usually can't do much. They have to bargain. Obama agreed to destroy Libya, Yemen, and Syria in return for the chance to do a deal with Iran. This probably would have helped us withdraw from the Middle East if Trump hadn't squashed the deal as soon as he possibly could. Presidents tend to be powerless in the face of the U.S. war machine. So my expectations of Joe Biden were pretty minimal. I had hopes that he'd do more on Yemen and Iran than he has done, but Afghanistan? I thought the U.S. military was going to be there for the rest of my life. I couldn't have been more wrong about that, and I couldn't be more happy to be wrong about that. But I wasn't the only one. This decision really does seem to have been like all Joe Biden. Up until March of this year, the U.S. military didn't think we were withdrawing from Afghanistan. In March of 2021, it was widely reported that Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, apparently had some kind of emotional breakdown in a high-level meeting at the very idea of leaving Afghanistan. In March of 2021, he was worried about Afghan women and argued passionately that we couldn't leave. We should have made a bigger deal about this for a number of reasons. That was March of 2021. Donald Trump, the President of the United States, had committed to withdrawing from Afghanistan in February of 2020. Yet a full year later, one of the middle managers in charge of the U.S. military thought it was somehow still up for negotiation. The words you may be looking for here are soft coup, and they would be appropriate for this situation. This also goes a long way to explain why the withdrawal was as much of a mess as it was. The U.S. military, despite being told by two elected U.S. presidents that we were leaving Afghanistan, had made no plans to do so as of March of this year. When you acknowledge this fact, it gets a lot less surprising that the withdrawal was chaotic. Biden wasn't just trying to manage this extremely difficult withdrawal, he also had to deal with a mutiny from U.S. generals. When Biden chose to blow off Trump's initial withdrawal deadline uh, in May, I assumed that meant we were staying forever. But having researched it more, I think this means that Biden realized in March that there were no plans to withdraw, and it was physically impossible to move the U.S. military in that direction in just two months. What happened in that meeting with Mark Milley in March of 2021 was the U.S. government finally facing up to the fact that the U.S. public was no longer going to tolerate its Afghanistan fraud. In the past couple months, we've just learned more and more about 
how outrageous this grift was. The military industrial complex keeps releasing stories that try to embarrass Biden, but end up humiliating the complex instead. One of their gambits was pointing out that Biden had cruelly crippled the Afghan Air Force by withdrawing all the US nationals that were necessary to keep it in the air. This was big in articles and was becoming very big on Twitter, until people started to question why exactly it was that we had given the Afghan government an $8 billion Air Force that could only be maintained by US contractors. It became disturbingly obvious that despite 20 years of lies from US generals, the plan had always been to stay in Afghanistan forever and generate kickbacks for US arms manufacturers forever. When people started pointing this out, we stopped hearing this story as much. The Afghan Air Force stabbed in the back myth was also hurt when one of its biggest advocates, a charismatic young Afghan general, was revealed as a war criminal and profiteer about a week after his big debut in the New York Times. The New Yorker article that featured these revelations is something all Americans should read. As with most colonial projects, there was a significant slice of the urban population that got real rights and privileges out of the US's trillion dollar war. We do need to be worried about what the Taliban is going to do to this population, and they are the main reason to keep negotiating with the Taliban. But did the benefits of imperial feminism really even extend to all of the women in Kabul? I kind of doubt it. And 75% of the Afghan population is rural. Even when the US occupation government was at its most powerful, with over 100,000 US troops on the ground, it barely reached the countryside where the majority of Afghan women live. This powerful New Yorker piece adds up the true cost of two decades of US war for most Afghan women. Expensive, rarely used, and quickly destroyed infrastructure, slaughtered family members, and never-ending fear of robotic death from above. That is everything we offered the majority of Afghan people, male and female, for 20 years. I challenge you to read this article and then try to tell me that US withdrawal was anything other than a massive gift for all humanity. The biggest story that the Pentagon and its henchmen have tried to sell us over the past two months is the idea that the 2,500 strong US troop deployment was sustainable. All we had to do to avoid this embarrassment was just keep up our steady diet of profitable war crimes forever. But the past week of testimony in Congress on the Afghanistan withdrawal has contradicted this. The bigger news from Mark Milley and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's testimony is that Biden really did ignore and countermand all of his advisors to do the right thing here and get us out. But Milley and Austin also admitted that the sustainability argument was a myth. Staying past September would have meant thousands, if not tens of thousands more troops. If we had stayed another decade, another surge would probably have been necessary, costing us yet another trillion dollars for nothing. Biden didn't just do the right thing in Afghanistan, almost completely on his own. He also, probably unintentionally, might have discredited the entire war on terror. The best argument that the militarists have is one that even I believed up until two months ago. Well, you can talk about ending forever wars, and I'm sure that makes a very satisfying slogan, but what you have to understand is that it's kind of infantile and unsatisfying. You see, when the United States ends a forever war, that doesn't mean that the war actually ends. In fact, the war will get worse because you see the United States is a stabilizing factor in these conflicts and to just precipitously leave would be, would be terrible, would create awful humanitarian consequences. So really, the only mature thing to do is to keep these forever wars going. Up until two months ago, I found that argument fairly persuasive. Not persuasive enough to continue any of these wars, of course, I believe in human freedom, but in Afghanistan especially, I believe that US withdrawal would lead to great bloodshed before stabilization. But that's not what happened. 
like at all. Do you wonder why you heard a ton about US withdrawal from Afghanistan for a week or two, but now you hear nothing? It's because the war ended the second we left. The Afghan government we poured hundreds of billions of dollars into evaporated before we even finished leaving. This is humiliating for the United States, but it is an extraordinary gift for the Afghan people. Everybody, including myself, expected a vicious return to the 1990s with a horrific civil war between the Taliban and the US occupation government that would have lasted for years. We expected hundreds of thousands of deaths, but that didn't happen. We ended our most involved forever war and Afghanistan almost instantly broke out in greater peace than it had experienced in 40 years. We were the whole problem, the whole time. To be clear, certain forces in Washington DC are working very hard to plunge this long suffering country back into war. The Taliban are also not good people. They are an insurgency that has won and I am sure there are many nasty things going on that we're not hearing about. It could all fall apart, but so far US media seems pretty desperate to find anything to complain about. Yeah, it sucks that the Taliban government doesn't include any women, but it's not exactly surprising. And I think most Afghan women probably prefer that to getting blown up by a death robot piloted by some US teenager in Florida. The other piece of reporting I implore you to read is the New York Times coverage of the horrific revenge killing of an Afghan family that my government carried out as its last act in this 20 year war. At first the Pentagon claimed that it had killed a bunch of terrorists. Then it was forced to back that up and say it was terrible that all this collateral damage had happened, but it was a good hit based on good intelligence. Finally, the reporting forced them to admit that they had murdered a family of 10, including seven children for no good reason at all. What's so horrifying about this killing is that this is how the Pentagon talks about all of its drone killings everywhere in the world. This killing that took place in Kabul, a city dense with journalists, while the whole world was focused on Afghanistan, was revealed to be a horrible crime. But most US drone attacks happen out in the middle of nowhere, where few journalists can travel even if anybody cared enough to spend the money to send a journalist out there. How many of the thousands of drone attacks we have paid for over the past 20 years have killed families just as pointlessly? 20% of them? Half of them? Most of them? We will never know. What we do know is that Joe Biden deserves a tremendous amount of credit for ending this horrific, pointless war. With today's video, I've mostly been pointing you to mainstream news sources, and that's been very intentional. Joe Biden's victory over US militarism here isn't some special secret. It's very obvious if you just read the reporting. Joe Biden is the first US president in history to do something for the benefit of the Afghan people. He has probably saved the US taxpayers trillions of dollars over the coming decades. And if the obvious lessons of the Afghan withdrawal can just be applied to the other US forever wars, the world could become a dramatically safer, happier place. We need to encourage Joe Biden to do that which means we need to celebrate his victory in Afghanistan. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, comment, and click the bell next to the subscribe button if you'd like to get notifications whenever I upload a new video. Thanks.